Before we start this week's show, I just want to take a moment and say my thoughts are with the Absolute Intense Wrestling family in Cleveland. Their longtime promoter, Chris Bryan, a.k.a. Chandler Biggins, he passed away early Tuesday morning. We shared a lot of laughs while podcasting, Chris and I, and also at the AIW shows. And he gave me an opportunity to do some commentary on some matches and meet some of my wrestling idols. I'll never forget that, Chris. He was also a big fan of Memphis Wrestling. He loved the King, Lance Russell, Dave Brown, and others. Thoughts are with John Thorne, AIW, and the Bryan family. May he rest in peace. The following show is a Pod Avenue production. You are cordially invited to have dinner with the King. Pull up a chair and join WWE Hall of Famer Jerry the King Lawler and Glenn Moore. Enjoy. All right, Jerry, another week here at Jerry Lawler's Memphis Barbecue Company here in Cordova. And, uh, geez, the place got cleaned up around here after last week. And uh, we have a guest. <laughs> you made you made such a mess last week, I, I'm telling you. Oh, but let's, let's remind everybody where we are. It's the Jerry Lawler's Memphis Barbecue Company, 465 North Germantown Parkway. Uh, right? It's, it's Memphis or... Uh, you know, it's 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 kind of confusing in the fact that you say Germantown Park, where everybody thinks that's Germantown, but it's all it's all Memphis, and that's a suburb of Memphis or whatever, Cordova, any way you want to put it. But it's Memphis, Tennessee, and that's where we are out here on Germantown Parkway. Come on by and see us and have some great food. And uh, I'm talking to everybody out there that's listening. I'm not talking to you, Glenn, because you have eaten me out of house and home around here. Good grief. Well, I'm not banned yet, like another person. We're not going to be not going to be talking about him, but. Uh, I'm not, I'm not banned. Last, so. week, last week with Kenny Bolin. You know, I mean, that, that's, why I, that's why I told you about that's why I told you about the fact that when we started this podcast, oh, I wasn't no. crazy about having to try to go out and uh, put people on the spot to come on and be guests every he single came week. On but his own. I know. I know. So that's why. But but you know what? Now, I've done I've 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 gone back on my word already after last week when we got rid of him and after we had to call the cops on him. I told you then. That's it. No more guests, Glenn. Yeah. And then what am I doing today? Hopefully, I've got another guest coming on. But I mean, <laughs> this shows up. But this guest uh, is Jerry Lee Lewis the third. He is the son of. I mean, this guy is world famous. Jerry Lee Lewis, the great uh, you know, rock and roll singer performer. So I mean, when you have, you know, that bloodline asking us to come on the show, I mean, you have to say yes, Jerry. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, we and, and uh, we're going to be talking if he if he makes it here. We're going to be talking about uh, the fact that the WWE has a pay per view coming up called Great Balls of Fire. And you're right, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, one of the most famous rock and rollers of all time, back to the, the you know part of the uh, that famous Memphis Quartet that, that uh, uh, came out of Sun Records here, along with Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash and and Carl Perkins and. Roy Orbison, all those guys in that same era, and Jerry Lee Lewis is out there still rocking, man, still rocking. And all after after all of these years, and his son Jerry Lee uh, the third, hopefully, will be on the show with us today, and we're going to be talking about his involvement in an upcoming WWE pay per view. But so I'm I'm excited to have Jerry Lee on here today, but no more no more Kenny Bolin, please. Okay. Yeah, he's he's banned from the show, officially banned from your restaurant and the show officially. Exactly. So he's gone. So today's show. Uh, well, no, wasn't it funny there when they were the cops were pulling him out of the restaurant and and he's so fat that he fell down and then he rocked himself to sleep. It was trying to get up. It was that, that was the he, only way they were able to finally get him out of here. And he's been on Twitter, you know, crying about it for a week. All his, you know, ten fans are are, are kind of you know crying about it too. So I mean, it, you know, Jerry. I give you he the number. Have any, yeah, he claims he's got all the. Fa- the only way I've said this before, the only way that Kenny Boland would ever be worth anything is if they start selling people by the pound. Oh, geez. You know, <laughs> I, I I tweeted this out on the you know official Dinner with King Twitter account. You know, it's our. You know, he talks about ratings. It's the least downloaded show, Jerry. <laughs> no one wants to hear it. Make sure, make sure that he knows that. Oh, I think he does. I think he, I think he does know that. But like I said, he's banned from the show. Banned from the restaurant, and uh, no more uh, Kenny Bolin. Now, the topic for this week's show, Jerry, is we're going to answer some questions. Topic? The to- we have a topic? This week? No topic. It's going to be all questions. We have a few questions before uh, your guest hopefully arrives here. Uh, some questions. So this is going to be 
Uh, Before more, you ask me the questions, why don't you ask me how my weekend went? I was getting was so there. Fun. I was getting there. I had to oh. ask you. You were you're always on the go. You're always traveling. You're always going somewhere on the weekend, whether it's you know wrestling in a town or you're going for a, a convention, a, a con here and there. Your your, your your drawings. How was DC an awesome con? It was awesome. That's what I was hoping you would ask me about. I'd been looking forward to that for a long time. I'd heard about how good the uh, Comic Con was in Washington D.C. This was the first time that we uh, we appeared at it, and we had I was there along with, of course, Mike Kingston with his Headlock comic books, and my fiance Lauren was was there helping us out. And man, the turnout was amazing. So I think they had over sixty thousand people come through the awesome con this weekend there in Washington, D.C. And it was just had had great weather for it. And uh, this place was, the as you can imagine, the convention center in the nation's capital is just enormous. I mean, it was huge, but the place was filled. There were vendors from every kind of every kind of uh, entertainment world that you can imagine. Good old Stan Lee was there signing autographs. And I always love to hear about Stan Lee. Stan Lee. I mean, he's like at a different comic book convention every single weekend. Of course, Stan Lee's the creator of you know Marvel Comics and Spider Man and all of these great Marvel characters, and then he makes a cameo appearance in every Marvel movie and everything. But Stan Lee is still out there going to these comic cons every single weekend, and he was in Washington this past weekend. But he's got he's 94 years old, Glenn. Wow. 94. Jeez. And uh, or he's going to be 94 this I think this this year, and and he's. He's still signing autographs and getting pictures made with people. People would come by and show me their pictures they just had made with Stan Lee. And, but now, now that I guess you have to be protective of him. He's like a national treasure, this guy, as far as the comic book world goes. And, and uh, so the rule is if you have your picture made with him, you cannot touch him. Cannot touch Stan Lee. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah, do not touch. And uh, no shaking hands, no anything like that. Don't even ask. And he doesn't even talk to you. You just you just uh, go up and you get your picture made and then you take your picture back and then you he'll sign the picture and it was his, his at 94 uh, God bless him his autograph was uh, is getting a little bit difficult to read but he still uh, he's still out there and plugging away and there were all kind of you know there were all kind of great uh, guests there people from stars from the from the Walking Dead and. Uh, Oh, gosh, uh, a lot of just different uh, TV shows and that sort of thing. Charlotte Flair was there on uh, Saturday, as was, uh, uh, how do you pronounce it? Sin- Sinsuke Nakamura. Shin- Shinsuke right? Nakamura. I mean, you do the pre-show, Shinsuke. Jerry. I mean, can't you know these guys' names? You're on the pre-show a lot. I do know their names, but I just have trouble pronouncing them. I've always had trouble pronouncing the, and as a matter of fact, somebody came up to me and said one of the favorite things that you used to do, and I didn't even remember to remember this, but we used to have a wrestler named Takamichinoku, and I apparently used to call him. This guy said, "Oh, I loved it when you called him Takamichinoku." <laughs> <I remember>. And <laughs> remember, remember, uh, remember, Kai. Just, you know, sometimes I have. Trouble. Remember, remember, Kai and Tai. The uh... oh, oh my gosh, Kai and Tai. <laughs> <laughs> they had that famous. They had the famous feud. Uh, I, I sort of got involved in that too. They had the famous feud with uh, Val Venus. Yeah, they had remember, Val. Remember that? They had Val because I think it was. Uh, I think it, the, the the Val Venus was hitting on one of the uh, Kyantai's, you know, valet or you know the woman <laughs> well, in, in the on. group. Val Venus hit on everybody. You know, that was that was his, that was his gimmick. <laughs> he brought out. The they brought out uh, a chopping block on the on, on the stage. And they had like this big thick sausage, and they had a so- they had a sword, and they chopped the they chopped the sausage, and they said choppy choppy your pee pee. Oh my gosh, that was so funny. Yeah, and then we even went off so far as I remember we had John Wayne Bobbitt on the show, and I interviewed I interviewed John Wayne Bobbitt, and of course I had a million of those one liners about what happened to poor John Wayne Bobbitt. I remember at the end I said, "Well, John, I don't want to cut you short, but we're going to have to end this." <laughs> Can you imagine if they tried to do those great kind of shows today? There's no way that would. There's no way you could air that kind of stuff. But I mean, back in the Attitude Era, man, we just got away with so much, so much stuff. And the funny thing is, though, you know, on the network, all that stuff you can still go back and watch it on the network, right? Yeah, that's all. All the Raws are on there. All the Smackdowns are on there. So you guys, you can go back and watch this uh, classic Raw moment with the with Kai and Tai and Val Venus, and so so they kidnap Venus. And they had him strung out, you know. They had him, you know, on uh, attached to the rafters. His hands were above his head, and they had, you know, it was, you know, they had the camera behind Venus. You couldn't see his 
is Johnson, but they had <laughs> they had it seem like they're going to chop you know, his Venus. <laughs> yeah, Venus. They're, they're going to chop off his Venus, and the lights <laughs> the lights go out, and they're screaming, and Val escaped before uh, because he said that he had sh- shrinkage, and he was able to <laughs> shrink enough to where his his Venus was not uh, was not oh cut by Kanti. Yeah, this stuff. I mean, this stuff. You, you, they couldn't do it today. This this stuff would not fly. <laughs> I'm glad to see that you ordered the smoked sausage plate today. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, but that's great. It, it comes already chopped up, so you don't have to you don't have to call in Kai and Ty. For yeah, Val Venus. He was uh, going after Mrs. Yamaguchi San. Who? <laughs> Miss, Miss Yamaguchi San, which was the uh, sister, I think, of Taka. <laughs> that was some fun stuff. That I was want great. To tell you it was. And that, that was great because, like, you know, obviously Taka Michinoku and Val Venus, you know, they weren't. You know, main event guys, but the storylines with with the mid carters were so strong and interesting and funny that, you know, it 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 made the whole show enjoyable. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was it was there was there was there was something going on with everybody that, as you say, was entertaining, and it was uh, it didn't it didn't matter what where you were on the card. I mean, you know that that stuff with Val Venus, and I remember going into um, oh gosh, there was then the. There was a group called Right to Censor. Uh, you remember those guys? Oh, yeah. That was uh, Stevie Richards, and you had Bull Buchanan, yeah. and I think yeah, I- and no, and none Ivory. And none of these guys, none of, none of those people would be considered like, you know, they weren't like the Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock or something like that. But all of their, you know, the, the things that they had going on was really, uh, really entertaining, really fun to watch. Wasn't there a whole- How did we get off the subject of the Awesome Con? <laughs> With, uh, choppy, choppy, oh, no, I said Charlotte Flair was there and uh, Nakamura, and um, it was it was a it was a great three days. I mean, we man, just so many people came through, and um, I had a piece of artwork that I had done. I, I think it was, a lot of people may have seen it on Twitter that a a, a, a lot of people were interested. In. I had, I had done a, a sketch or a drawing of Adam West as Batman, and so uh, there was and there was a big. Um, Oh, just a big memorial thing that people could sign, you know, about Adam West. And everybody was really talking about the, that loss to everybody in the comic world because, you know, he was such a he was such a mainstay and such a icon as far as comic book conventions go. As a matter of fact, uh, he, he I think he had originally been scheduled to be uh, at at Awesome Con, you know, before he passed away. Uh-huh. So. Yeah, it was it was but it was it was a fun show a lot of a lot of great people there saw a lot of old friends and uh had a good time all right let's get into the uh the questions jerry we have a ton of questions here we're gonna get in my answer before uh before hopefully jerry lee lewis the third your guest uh your first official guest on the show officially uh yeah, joining okay. us on the show all right so here's some questions for you here's the first one this is from john in cincinnati he wants to know which current WWE superstar would fit well in old school Memphis? Who? Um, gosh. Uh, you know, it, when I look back on what we used to do in Memphis, when um, we would always we we were always excited if we could find some kind of a um, a big scary looking guy that that. That you know, I I I'd been on top there for so long, and and what we what we would do is we could just create, and, we, and of course we had like Jimmy Hart there as a manager who had, uh, who had just constant heat with me that just lived on and on, and then Jimmy could just bring in anybody, and their heat would transfer over to uh you know to the to whoever Jimmy brought in, but they also had to be credible in the fact that they had to look like, um. Uh, that they were going to be a major threat to me, basically, at the time. So we were always looking for guys. And then, you know, we would create guys like like uh, Kamala or bring in guys like Bam Bam Bigelow or, you know, these. Uh, we really liked the monster type guys uh, back in back in old school Memphis. Um, now, when so who would who would that bring to mind now today? Of course, I mean, you know, we could have made a ton with a guy like Brock Lesnar because he looked he looks uh you know, un- unbeatable. We just, we, you know, we just, we just would take guys that just uh, were big and scary looking, and and make the people think that there was no way anybody could beat them. And so there's there's a lot of guys in the WWE today that that uh, that would would fill that bill. Um, and then then uh, you know there were a lot of guys that are you know that that 
came through or, or were huge stars that that started in Memphis just that way. Guys like like The Undertaker. I mean, you know, we started him down in Memphis as a as a big, mean, scary guy that just looked like nobody, you know, nobody was going to be able to beat him. Um, uh, so, and, and so uh, let me think who could if I had to pick out one guy and say, we're going to bring this guy into Memphis and to go against, say, me in my prime at the Mid-South Coliseum. Hmm. That's a good question, though, from, from a listener. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, we could we could do wonders with a Baron Corbin. Um, what about a Braun Strowman? Oh my gosh! Yes, there you go. Yes, Br- yeah. Any a, a, a Bray Wyatt? Yeah, I would love to have had. I would love to have had the Bray Wyatt character down down in Memphis for our old school man. That that would have that would have fit right into what we did, and and the whole Wyatt family. Any of those guys. We could have we could have made a ton of money with at the at the Mid South Coliseum in our old school Memphis days. It's 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 strange, Jerry, and I, you know, this can be a whole episode down the road. But how when when we asked you that question about making money and you know drawing people to come to the come to the you know Mid South Coliseum or anywhere you're at, you know you immediately go to the big guys, you know the the, the big you know monster like men, and nowadays it seems like wrestling has shifted you know to the to the you know the 205 guys and and it's the smaller stature kind of guys uh you know like a daniel bryan you did the 205 you know cm punk when he was in wwe you have those those kind of mold of the guys it's become a smaller kind of wrestling business now well i mean i'm not i'm not gonna say i can't really agree with you there because we always had i mean we the memphis territory was basically known for for smaller guys I mean, we when we brought when we had a big monster type guy, that was the uh, that was the exception. Most of the guys were smaller. I mean, myself, you know, um, not a not a big guy, and I was the, the the main featured guy there for so many years. Superstar Bill Dundee, not even six feet tall. Um, a lot of our guys, you know, back in Memphis were not were not big guys. That's why when we did get a big guy in there, it was um, you know it was kind of something special. And I think what happened was that that uh, you know the WWE went to it, it, it went away from the the, the smaller guys to um, I think you know there was a time when the when the big guys in the WWE were special and then it was like well you know hey if one big guy is good two big guys will be even better and three big guys will be even better than that and four big the next thing you know the WWE got to be known for just you know, it was all big guys. And so, um, I, I, and I think what has happened now, is just sort of mirror society uh, in the fact that uh, our, our, your attention span is shorter. You want more action in, in, in uh, less amount of time. And, and so in order to give, you know, I think that in order to deliver that kind of fast paced action, you kind of got to go with the, with the smaller guys as you, you know, when you watch those cruiserweights or when you watch the 205, I mean, man, it's, it's all that stuff is all the actions lightning fast. Sometimes it's so fast. You can't even, uh, you know, those guys are, you try to do commentary for it. Those guys are wrestling faster than you can talk. So it's, um, it's just, it's just kind of shifted back to where actually back to where it used to be uh, a long time ago. All right, second question from Mike in New York. He wants to know, what is the, the main problem or number one problem when it comes to wrestlers nowadays? And if you could give one piece of advice to a wrestler that's you know, in training, what would, you, what would you tell him or her? Man, I can't tell you how many times over the years that I've been asked, you know, is there any advice that you can give me? And, and I, I try to shy away from those advice type questions i i don't like to throw anything out there because i it's it's funny you know if if you look at like like people usually ask for advice about how do you how do you get in the business or how do you become a wrestler and and when you really if you really studied and looked at it uh, you know unless you come from a wrestling family where your father or or mother or somebody was in the business and then you just come along and follow in their footsteps uh, unless it's a situation like that it's it, everybody gets in the business a different way. So it's, and, and mine, in my case, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever gotten in the business in, you know, um, in even similar in a similar situation. I mean, you know, I came from an art background, drawing pictures and, you know, who winds up drawing pictures of, 
uh, cartoon pictures of wrestlers and sending them into a TV station. And then the next thing you know, they like the artwork and you got to meet the wrestlers and then get your foot in the door of the wrestling business that way. And, and then and then go from that to owning a wrestling company and being, a, you know, being in the business for 45 years. So I, I, I can't really give anybody advice. I mean, I can't tell them, hey, go out and become an artist and draw some pictures of wrestlers. <laughs> yeah. that, that ain't gonna, that ain't gonna fly for anybody nowadays. So um, it's tough for me to say that I don't, I don't really know what ad- advice I would give anybody on how to get in the business. It's, it's just changed so much over the years. I mean, now, you know, if you want to be in this business, you, you, you aspire to be in the WWE. That's, that's what it's all about. And, you know, now, even, even the ways of getting in the WWE have changed, you know, now with NXT and their, and having their, um, you know, own developmental company, which is something that they didn't have, that wasn't even thought of back when I was getting in the business. So, you know, if I, but I would say some kind of way, if you, if you really, it's your heart's desire and it's your dream and it's your passion, and, and I and I wouldn't I wouldn't even attempt it if it wasn't if it wasn't something that you just thought you couldn't live without if that's not something that you uh, that you think that you can't be anything other than a wrestler then you just gotta you gotta you know set that as your goal and and don't take no for an answer and and don't give up and keep keep fighting until you until you get the door opened and somewhere down the line something will usually happen that'll that'll open a door and you got to be there you got to be there ready to jump in when it opens and so um, uh, I, you know I don't I don't I don't like to give advice other than to say hey if it's if it's something you really want go for it and 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 don't take no for an answer All right here's another question this is from Craig and he's actually in Memphis and he wants to know Jerry do you know who actually owns the Mid-South Coliseum <laughs> Do I know who owns the Mid South Coliseum. That's yeah. a, well, of course, it's owned by the city of Memphis, and uh, man, the Mid South Coliseum for 20 straight years. We, you know, we were every Monday night in the Mid South Coliseum. We drew more wrestling drew more fans to the Mid South Coliseum than any other event ever in its history, and uh, you know, we we were there 20 years, averaging over those 20 years with an average of about 8,000 people every single Monday night in the Mid South Coliseum. So. Um, it's owned by it's owned by the city of Memphis, but of course, unfortunately, now uh, uh, due to the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, that was you know something that got pushed through a long time ago, and uh, they say it would cost too much money to bring it up to this, those standards. And then, of course, with uh, we have we have a new building, the Memphis FedEx Forum here and I think they have some sort of a contract with the city that no other arena can have that would seat more than 5,000 people can be in competition with the FedEx Forum. So um, the Mid-South Coliseum, unfortunately, is just kind of sitting there. It looks exactly the same as it did when it was built, but it's just sitting out at the fairgrounds in the center of Memphis, Tennessee, vacant and closed up, boarded up. And uh, I, I actually uh, was on the plane, a flight one time with one of the Memphis officials, and he said, Jerry, we would sell you the Mid South Coliseum. The city of Memphis would sell you the Coliseum for a one dollar. Wow. I said, "Really?" And they said, "Yeah, but I just want to remind you that just sitting there, the cost of it being closed, just sitting there the way it is, cost the city sixty three thousand dollars a month." Wow. Yeah. So that's a, not a that's not a house note that I could take on right now. <laughs> Even though I'd like to have the Coliseum, I don't want to be paying sixty-three thousand dollars a month for it, you know. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Sadly, I mean, it's a great building, great venue, the greatest sports uh, arena in in Memphis history. But uh, it's owned by the city of Memphis, and hopefully, they won't ever. You know, there's been talk over the years of tearing it down and basically making a parking lot out of it, or 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 doing something that they could re. Um, you know, kind of have another repurpose it for some other things, maybe museums or different sort of things like that. But uh, hopefully it just it, it won't ever get torn down. Hopefully they'll find something else they can do with it. Uh, here's a question. Um, James and Dylan, they ask you about some of your commentary partners. And um, I'm going to amend this question, but they want to know any good stories that you might have on the road with Jr. and uh, Michael Cole. Um, and also, who did you when you're on the road? You know, during the Attitude Era, who did you travel with? Um, actually, Michael Cole and I did not ever travel together. Michael travel. Michael likes to travel by himself, and I I 
really prefer traveling by myself as well. Um, and and when you say on the road, the, the reason for that is like, you know, everybody lives in a different city. Michael lives all way down in so- South Texas, almost on the border of Mexico. And so, you know, he would fly to, from, from there for, or like fly from Galveston usually to, to, um, whatever city that we, our show was going to be in. And then I'm always flying from Memphis. So there really, there, there's very little traveling together that goes on uh, unless what would happen was when you got to, when you got to Monday night raw, uh, from where you came over from wherever you came, then if you were on SmackDown the next day, uh, then a lot of the times the guys would travel from that from the city that Raw was in to the city that SmackDown was in. Sometimes they would share a, a rental car or, or drive together that way. And Jr. and I, we would, uh, you know, we would we would travel together on those on those trips uh, almost every single week. Uh, and there, there's a million Jr. stories uh, of of he and I and our different traveling escapades and and, and our. Find us with the first thing we always had, you know, we always had to seek out. JR loved Cracker Barrel restaurants. I mean, if I could count the number of times that JR and I have eaten at a Cracker Barrel. Um, but man, if I ever get JR over here to my my um, my Memphis barbecue company, he'll he'll throw rocks at Cracker Barrel next time he goes by. But yeah, um, you know, it's it's I can't really think of any one particular thing that comes to mind with with jr and i traveling together but um and and as i said cole and i didn't really do much traveling together all right final question and i'm not sure if you want to answer this because we are in a pc world but this is your podcast you can answer anything you want oh boy he wants no i can't say anything i want (laughs) because it all this this goes out and it lives forever out there now you know that's true that's true but this person wants to know your the bill's beer report they want to know who 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 had your favorite puppies (laughs) During the attitude oh era. my gosh <laughs> what a question right here at the dinner table who had my favorite puppies is, is lauren um, here is lauren here today i'm not sure i, I, can't, I haven't seen lauren around <laughs> yeah lauren is, as a matter of fact there's lauren right over there <laughs> lauren hi look she wanted to say anything yell at me just say yell hi there she is over there, there. Is. <laughs> so i don't know if i'm going to be safe talking about my favorite puppies <laughs> and and you know that's that's the other thing that we talk about now that uh how the how the wrestling world has changed. I mean, that was I, I can't tell you. You know, we were at just at Awesome Con uh, this weekend. I can't tell you. That's that's probably the number one thing that I get asked, uh, and that's something that will probably live forever. Is fans will come up and say, you know, as they're getting an autograph or they're getting a picture signed or whatever, they, they'll say inevitably, King, say puppies for me, please, just one time, say puppies. You know, and I'll always I'll look around. And I say I usually have to see them to say it, but uh, then I'll then I'll go puppies, and that you know that's just the that brings back the the memories of their childhood. And it's like I, and that's the other thing. If I had a a nickel at every one of these comic cons for every time somebody said, "Man, you and Jr. You're the voice of my childhood." You know, the voice the voice of every Monday night growing up. Uh, that's that's all that's all we listen to, and so um, uh, but uh, but as far as the favorite puppies. I don't know. I, I, I never, I think, <laughs> listen to Lauren over there. Lauren says, duh, Sable. <laughs> well, well, don't say that because you have Brock Lesnar Trish, listening. Trish Stratus was going, yeah, that's right. I can't, it's, it's scary to say Sable's were your favorite puppy because Brock Lesnar may uh, be out there listening to this podcast <laughs> somewhere. And I don't want to, I don't want to get this stink out from him the next time yeah, I see him. No. But then, um, oh my gosh! Over, so you know that, but that was the, the great thing about the uh, the Attitude Era. I mean, there were just so many great divas with the great puppies that uh, that they just. I don't want to say they all run together, but yeah, I guess I guess Sable. Um, I don't know if Trish Stratus. She wasn't really known for her puppies. Yeah, yeah she, she was. Had- she was known at least. <laughs> Lawrence no. over there. Lawrence over there looks like she's got arthritis in both hands. She's holding her hands up to her chest. <laughs> she said she had good-looking boobs. Well, she did, but <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't remember seeing any bad ones other than, other than, oh my gosh, oh, do you no. remember the? I know. I, I never going to say. Oh, I know it. May Young. Oh no. Oh, May Young came out there and actually sh- showed her puppies, and I think I said those aren't puppies; those are Rottweilers. <laughs> Uh, May Young actually showed her puppies on, on uh, a live broadcast. It was it was a, a 
a sight I'll never forget. No, I, I was. And I wish I'd. I wish I'd never seen. <laughs> I was a teenager during the Attitude Era, so I had. I was uh, very tuned into Raw when when it came to puppies. Now my favorite set of puppies. You might know her, King, very well. <laughs> the cat. Mm. Yeah. Well, you can you can talk about that if you want to. I'm not going to. No, I'm not. No, I'm just. No, my favorite was Trish. I love. Uh, obviously, Trish was. Trish. Trish. She was like a crush. Uh, my crush. Way back in my teenage years, watching Raw on a regular basis. I don't know. I, I mean, you know what? It's it's something about. I mean, I, yeah, I, I loved I loved Trish Stratus, but I swear, she, Trish was I I think one of the first one of the first divas that I really looked at more as a a wrestler than I did a diva. It was almost like you know, it was almost like Trish really um, put wrestling first as far as in in front of being sexy or in front of being beautiful or something like that. You know, I I always looked at her more as a more as a, a wrestler than I did just a, a piece of arm candy. It's like a lot of you know a lot of the, the, the girls were valets and that sort of thing at the time. Yeah. And, and her, speaking of all of that, what, speaking of all of that, what did you think of what did you think of Lana's um, appearance there, her first uh, wrestling match? Do these now? These photos are all over the internet, and uh, it's kind of hard to even miss this if you're on Twitter or on you know different social media. Do, do these what? I mean, I know they're beautiful women, and they can. Look, you're almost speechless. Listen to you. <laughs> they're, they're beautiful ladies, and they can wrestle very, very well. Okay, yeah. Do, they they have to know that the possibility of this happening is is very, very high when they put on the outfit like that, right? Possibility of what happening? What are you talking about, Glenn? Oh, Come on, geez. spit it out. I'm not. I, I'm not going to go there. It's like with you and the cat. I'm. You're not going to go there. I'm not going to go there, and be the one that brings this up. <laughs> But Lana, Lana, <laughs> Lana's uh, attire was very revealing. How about that? Yeah, there you go. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Not in my book. I mean, I know, but like, like if, if I put on something like that, I know that I'm going to be showing a lot more than I want to be showing. I mean, they, they these girls have to know, right? Well, I don't know yet. I guess you'd have to ask them. Because okay. <laughs> it's it's all about empowering women these days. We gotta, you know, we gotta we gotta do that. Well, and that's one thing that that's one thing that disturbed me about about uh, and hopefully they'll they'll fix that some kind of way. But, you know, I mean, here's uh, uh, I mean, because that's that's what WWE has been about. That's the, the whole you know, we don't even call them divas anymore. It's the women's division because it's about empowering women. And I think that so much, uh, you know, so much of the emphasis that the WWE has put on the women's division has done that. And that's and that's why I was disappointed to see. In the first ever historic women's you know, ladder match, th- that they had to have a man climb the ladder and retrieve the Money in the Bank briefcase. Yeah, then he Ellsworth he brought it down to Carmella, and Carmella uh, officially won the match because she had the briefcase in her possession first. Yeah, so a lot of people are, are upset about that. So you're you're one of those people. Upset I'm one about of that? them. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm in the crowd. I'm one of those upset people. Somebody somebody needs to do something about it. Maybe maybe they could throw Ellsworth in there with the women. And let them uh, let them uh, take care of that business themselves. I mean, Ellsworth, say what you want about him. I mean, he's not the most manly looking guy out there. No, he is not. He's, he's like, uh, uh, I, you know, and I, I, I really I think I told you this once before. I get upset when I, I was in the WWE for uh, 25, 25 years. And I was in there for like 20 years before I ever even got uh, a T-shirt. And here all of a sudden this nowadays, you know, this guy, James Ellsworth, who uh, I don't know if that's his face. It looked like his neck threw up. Uh, but all of a sudden, here's him, this guy. And the first week he's in there, which, he, you know, if you ask me, he should be buying a ticket. But anyway, the first week he's on the show, he's got a T-shirt out. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, he's not the most manly looking guy. And I think that. I think the best idea would be to have the women uh, take their take their frustrations out on him personally. Yeah, I mean, you got to have that moment where the you know whoever was going to win at the top of the ladder grabbing the you know the, the suitcase and having that moment at the top of the ladder on top of the ring and, and having that you know that, that that lives on forever. Instead, you have Ellsworth taking it down, shrugging his shoulders, climbing down the ladder and handing it to Car- Carmella. 
Yeah, and his only explanation was, hey, it was a no disqualification match. Anything goes, yeah. and I guess all all that's true. But I just, uh, you know, I just thought that took away. I just thought it took away from the importance of the women themselves in that in that match. All right. So those are the questions we have for this week. If you want to send more questions, then you can tweet at us at Dinner with King or email us Dinner with King at podavenue.com. That's Dinner with King at podavenue.com, and uh, we'll answer on a future episode. But we appreciate everybody sending your questions in. Speaking of which, King, don't you have something new to tell us? Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Now, Audible, you got to check this out. Audible has changed my way of looking at books. I no longer have to take the time to read a book because now, thanks to Audible, I just listen to books. And, and let me tell you, Audible has the best audiobook performances and the largest library and the most exclusive content that you're going to find anywhere. I mean, if you like mysteries, Audible has them. If you like romance, Audible has them. And uh, in my case, I like science fiction. And if you were like, uh, like I was doing yesterday, I was listening to Batman on Audible. And and, and I tell you what, you experience things like the hair raising on the back of your neck when you're listening or a shiver down your spine. Because with an Audible sci-fi performance so powerful, you can actually feel like you're transported to, in my case yesterday, Gotham City or maybe even another dimension, even while you're just sitting in traffic. It's awesome. I mentioned Audible Books' extensive library. They also have books by by Mick Foley or Chris Jericho, Shawn Michaels, Dusty Rhodes, Brock Lesnar. Even Bill After's book, His Wrestling Fix, is on Audible. It's great. I'm telling you, you got to try it. And here's what you can do right now. You can start a 30-day trial, and your first Audible book is free. Here's how you learn more. Go to audible.com slash king. That's audible.com dot com slash k i n g trust me you're gonna love audible you just gotta try it well all right glenn check it out here comes my friend that i told you was gonna be here today i was i was really worried but now that i see he's actually here i feel better about everything jerry <laughs> lee lewis the third uh come on in here jerry have a seat we're we're just uh unfortunately Glenn has already cleaned up a couple of plates here, as you can tell. We were, we were, we were waiting on you to get here. But, hey, welcome to, uh, you know, Jerry Lawler's Memphis Barbecue Company out here in Germantown. And we want to thank you for coming by. And, hey, we just wanted to have you in and talk a little bit about, well, the, the for, one of the things for sure we're going to talk about is, is your dad's uh, involvement in the upcoming WWE pay-per-view that's called uh, Great Balls of Fire. But, first of all, Jerry, thanks for coming by. Hey, man, no problem. Thank you for having me out. You know, I'm looking forward to pulling up a, a plate of barbecue myself while we're hanging out today. You look a lot, you look a lot, you, well, no, I was going to say, you still look really, really young, but you're a little older than the last time I, <laughs> the last time I saw you. The last time, I, I think the last time that I actually uh, had the opportunity, you and I were talking one-on-one, was uh, a while back at, at the... The old Memphis Pyramid, which is now the Bass yep. Pro Shop here in Memphis, but it used to right. be our big arena where we had we had a wrestling events. And your dad, Jerry Lee Lewis, and you were, and, and I think your mom too came came to one of the shows there, right? Yeah, man, that that was a fun show. My my hair was a little fluffier, and I was a little shorter then, but man, that was <laughs> really cool. You know, Rock came out and said how he met Dad on Beale Street the night before, and I remember something like I think the Rock had got his butt kicked the the uh, the previous week on Raw and Dad sang him "Great Balls of Fire" to make him feel better. <laughs> oh man, that was that was really awesome. Well, listen, speaking of uh, speaking of Great Balls of Fire, there's been a lot of uh, controversy and a lot since the annou- announcement was made that one of the upcoming uh, WWE pay per views is entitled. I mean, you know, every every pay per view has a title. Uh, Roadblock, or all, you know, all of these different titles. Of course, WrestleMania and SummerSlam, and all of, all of the major ones like that. But then we have all of these other titles sprinkled in, and now uh, they've come up with a, a new pay-per-view title called Great Balls of Fire. Do you, Jerry Lee, uh, do you have any idea how that thought process happened? How that that name came about? Well, for me, you know, I I think a lot of it goes back to Dad and, and Dad's Dad's personality. You know, he's the original wild man of rock and roll. Right. So, I mean, I think it's very easy to compare him with, with some of the stunts that get, you know, thrown out in the ring. <laughs> well, well, he is he is truly, without a doubt, the original uh, rock and roll wild man. And, and so I, I guess, I mean, I, 
all I know about w- what happened was, uh, you know, I, your dad and I share uh, one of the same attorneys and our friend Joe Barton. And I got a call one day from Joe. Of course, I had already heard that there was going to be a pay-per-view named Great Balls of Fire. And I didn't I didn't I didn't put the two together at the time. And then, of course, uh, Joe gave me a call and said that uh, asked me if I knew who to get in touch with up in the legal department of the WWE, because <laughs> I guess they I may, maybe I don't know if they had already talked to you guys or didn't get permission yet to uh, or didn't know that the, the phrase Great Balls of Fire was trademarked. Is that is that what happened? Well, it was kind of like the ball had started rolling. You know, uh, we were in talks, and um, I don't know if maybe they didn't know ahead of time that we owned the marks and that, you know, decided to go ahead with marketing. We're like, oh, guys, pump the brakes. <laughs> we're cool to do this, but, you know, we've got some things we need to work out first. So, Well, that's good. And it, but, and it all got worked out. I don't know. Have you seen... Have you seen the promo for it? Because it really is awesome. I mean, you know, I, I, at first, like I said, when I heard the title was Great Balls of Fire, uh, I mean, you know, in the past, they've they've talked about they've talked about <laughs> Vince's grapefruits and that sort of thing. So I didn't know if I didn't know if it was that if that was the right. Yeah, I didn't know if that was the connotation that they meant by Great Balls of Fire or not. But then then you know afterwards, and I saw the. Uh, I saw the promo, and it had your dad, you know, singing that that famous, famous song, uh, and 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 the and the the promo that they put together is just awesome. Right. So I, I think it's great. I don't really know exactly what it has to do with wrestling, but it's it's <laughs> it's, it's a great promo. So it's it's going to be fun. I think they definitely need me uh, to be at that pay per view and to sit yeah, ringside I, I and, and be announcing it for sure. Yeah, I need to and throw fire at everybody. Don't you that, think that would be the best? Especially maybe if Dad could even get out there. We have a piano match. <laughs> oh my gosh! And then at the end, we could set his piano on fire like he's done in the past, right? Wouldn't that make it great? <laughs> it would make it awesome. It really would. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, now, you guys, um, you you guys. I, I don't know if you if you remember. We talked about this before, but your mom, Carrie, um, mm-hmm. she goes way back to. Uh, she had a little bit of a wrestling background in the well, not wrestling <laughs> background, but. But involvement in the sense that when, uh, you know, before she was married to your dad, she was in a, a singing group uh, yep. called the McCarver Sisters. Yep. And, I and I actually had them sing on some of my records that I, that I well, they didn't, they weren't released, they escaped. But I, no. some, of my, some of my records, Carrie McCarver and the, and the McCarver Sisters sang on. And we even did a concert one night at the Mid-South Coliseum. And, of course, uh, Carrie and her sisters and, and her dad, Bob McCarver, they had no idea this was going to happen, but right in the middle of the concert, because we had built this thing up. I mean, you know, it's going to be, oh, man, Jerry Lawler, Jimmy Hart, we're doing this big right, right. concert with the McCarver sisters singing back up. And, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of the concert, handsome Jimmy Valiant comes out, interrupts the whole thing, busts the guitar over my head. And, and that was the, that was the end, you know, sp- smashes into a thousand pieces. And that was the end of the concert. But, but uh, I think your mom and, 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 and certainly her dad were really upset that they didn't get to finish their singing, you know. But, but <laughs> we go back a long way. I don't know, man. There's a, there's a video uh, it pops up on my feed uh, every once in a while of, uh, I want to say uh, it's you maybe, maybe talking to Dave Brown uh, and you're like, I think it's Dave anyway. And you're like, Dave, uh, you ever seen a hit record made before? And then you walk to the back, and then they, you know, there's my mom and her sister. Yeah, I think exactly, they're, they're on my video. video. Like, <laughs> That's right. That was the world's greatest wrestler, and that was actually, actually, it was Lance Russell. We brought him into the studio. I didn't okay. even remember that. You're right. World's greatest wrestler song, and there's uh, uh, your mom and her sisters are singing on that on that video as well. So yeah. you can go to you can probably go to YouTube and look up Jerry Lawler's world's greatest wrestler, and there you'll see. Uh, there you'll see Jerry Lee's uh, mom, uh, in, in in back in the day doing doing this backup on that on that song. But mm-hmm. and now and and now you guys um, speaking of singing and songs and everything, uh, let's talk a little bit about your dad Jerry Lee Lewis. He is still yeah. out there and rocking away. As a matter of fact, this weekend he's going to be in, in performing, right? Yeah, man, still rocking and rolling. He's at BB King's uh, New York this weekend. You know he plays uh, back on Beale Street next month at his club. The month after that, he's out in Nevada. Uh, I mean, and he's pretty much going till the end of the year. So, I mean, busy, busy, busy. Yeah, that's awesome. That's another thing we share uh, now. We both have a club on Beale Street. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can't tell you how, how excited I was 
to all of a sudden be standing there one day on Beale Street, historic, world famous Beale Street, and I'm just standing out in the middle of the street, and I look, I look down, uh, well, I look up on one corner, and you know, there's BB King's uh, club right there on Beale Street. Then I look mm-hmm. down to the other end of the street, and there's Jerry Lee Lewis's club on Beale Street, and then boom, right situated right between those two, now is Jerry Lawler's Hall of Fame Bar and Grill, and it's just, I mean, I. It's still amazing to me to be it's a, it's included a with, you know, with, with it, right? <laughs> yeah, no kidding, with historic names like those two guys. But yeah, that's awesome that your dad, Jerry Lee Lewis, is going to be this weekend at BB King's in in New York, and then then performing the rest of the year. I got to uh, I got to sort of help introduce him at the at the last Memphis and May uh, Music Fest uh, mm-hmm. that he was at the year before last. Uh, my good friend and your good friend and and your dad's good friend, uh, George Klein was yeah. there to do the introductions. I got to go out st- on stage first. Thousands and thousands of people right there on the banks of the Mississippi River uh, to see Jerry Lee. And, and I, I introduced George Klein and brought George out. And, and then uh, then we both introduced Jerry Lee. And I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I, I they, they brought him kind of brought him up on stage or well, backstage before his performance. And, right. um, you know, he, he, ha- he had a, I think he had a, a walking cane there to kind of help stabilize him. Mm-hmm. Sat him down. And, and he was just, you know, everybody wanted to have their picture made with him. I went over and, got, and, and had a picture made with him and everything. But he was just very quiet and very still. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I, I don't know if he's going to be up to this performance. And then, and, then, and then George and I you know, introduced him. And they kind of, two guys walked him over to the piano. And he sat down. It was like a hush was over the thousands of people and everything. Right. And he looked out over the crowd. And man, all of a sudden, boom! He hit that first note, and I think it may have—I don't know—I don't know if that was the first. Uh, uh, I don't think "Great Balls of Fire" was the first song that he started into. But man, I was just—you were just transported back all of a sudden to the '50s. It was like the Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, the Wild Man of Rock and Roll, was still there. It was—it was amazing performance. And that's kind of you know what I, what I love about Dad's show. You know, it, 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 when he walks out these days, because of how he walks out, you know, it adds a level of mystery to the show. It's like, okay, what's what's about to happen here? Are we are we are we seeing the end of it or or, or right. what? And then you know, Dad sits down and literally, just like you said, the years melt away, and and you get an amazing show. It's really good. Yeah. Now, and and you're you're down there in right now. You guys, uh, he lives, and you live in Nesbit, Mississippi, right? And you guys are going to be you guys are going to be doing tours and that sort of thing of, of Jerry Lee's home. Yeah, we we do tours six days a week. Um, you can book tickets at the thelewisranch.com. Uh, you know, Dad Dad's still here. He pops in and out uh, when he's here, so that's always fun for for the guests when they're showing up. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get down there and see you guys. That sounds really awesome. And 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 now this is the, this is where he's been in Nesbitt, Mississippi. For, for how many years now? For for over forty years. I mean, I mean, he was in wow. been in Memphis for, you know, since he basically started recording at Sun, and then not too long after that is when he moved on to Nesbitt. Yeah, you know, uh, and speaking of Sun Records, I would just every time my friends come into come into town into Memphis, that's one of the places that I always take them because it is still that old Sun Record place right down there off of uh, off of Union Avenue. You can still walk in the original, I mean, the original office and the original little small studio. As a matter of fact, you can still record there if you want to. You can, if you want to pay the money, you can go and record a song there. But, I mean, mean, they still have some of the original equipment. And you can stand and and with the microphone and and in the exact spot where that really world-famous photograph was taken of your dad, Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, and and Carl Perkins all standing there at a piano. Did I take you there, Glenn? Not yet, King. You don't take me anywhere. You just take me here to, to feed me, then you send me off my way, buddy. <laughs> well, you got the barbecue. That's what's important, right? Yeah, I'm, well, I, mean, yeah. I was catching up on my barbecue <laughs> plate while you guys were talking. But I have a, I have a few questions of uh, back to the pay-per-view because I want to put my Michael Cole hat back on, my investigative journalist hat, <laughs> and, and ask you, uh, is this going to be a one-time thing with a pay-per-view name, or is this going to be uh, a, a yearly thing? And what do you think that... You know, will be in the future with the the Great Balls of Fire name. Well, you know, we're looking forward to it being an annual event. Uh, we think being a part of the WWE is you know, very synergistic. Well, our words there synergistic for not only Dad but our brand because I mean, 
think about that name. I mean, Great Balls of Fire. I mean, you got to have a level of hot headedness to be able to, you know, throw down at an event called Great Balls of Fire. And so, really, what better event to do it than at a WWE pay per view? So, you're, you're in your eyes. This might be a yearly thing, the way that you've been. Yeah, uh, yeah, we think so, absolutely. Yeah, and okay, I have to ask, or I wouldn't be, you know, have you have you come on and whatnot? But what was the? There uh, wouldn't be any. There wouldn't be any need for you to even be here, right? So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> how it, how much did they did they give you for the for the name? Oh man, man uh, I you know. I wish that, I wish I could say that. You know, there <laughs> there's confidential issues that keep me from saying it, but I mean. Might have had to do a money in the bank match by the time it all gets said and done. <laughs> <laughs> Which just just had the money in the bank this past week. Did you get a chance right, to watch exactly. any of the dirty? What's that? Did you get a chance to watch any of the money in the bank pay per view? I, I did get to watch it. I, I saw some pretty you know shocking things go on. Uh, the the ladies match went pretty crazy, and and then the men threw down really hard. So, I mean, look. Looking forward to some really, you know, great things to see how they uh, cash in those boxes, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of stuff that went down at Money in the Bank, and I, I could just, I'm just, I'm just uh, excited and and apprehend, not apprehensive. I'm just excited and and wait, can't wait to see what is going to go down at Great Balls of Fire. I mean, because like you know, they have to, they have to live up to the name of the pay per view. That's right. that's whenever they name a pay per view something. That's that's the whole focus. We got to live up to this name, and so right. with a name and, like and Great Balls in, of Fire. And so far, going into the pay per view, uh, you know, up until last night, the only match that we knew for sure was uh, Brock Lesnar and Samoa Joe. But now, you know, we have the the ambulance match is, that's set up with uh, with Roman and a uh, man. An ambulance match at Great Balls of Fire just sounds really good to me. <laughs> yes, it does. It's going to be something. We've uh, we are we are really excited about it, and we're we thank you for coming by here uh, today, Jerry Lee. And look, anytime, man, anytime you want to come by on the podcast, you know it's usually just me and Glenn here. So anytime you want to come back by and stop in, we'll be more than glad to have you. And, and you can bring your dad too if you want to. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I'd love to get back in here to the restaurant with y'all and, and, and have some more barbecue. I mean, you know, I'm only. So far down the road when I when I'm at home, so I mean, let, get speak, back, speaking so. of your dad, let me ask you one question because somebody told I'm not sure who told me this. Um, oh gosh, but anyway, somebody said that he is a big fan of the old TV show Gunsmoke. Is that true? Man, uh, that's totally true. And Marshall, Matt, Dylan, and the crew that that that's his friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> he loves watching Gunsmoke. Oh wow, I, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of those old uh, those old old tv shows myself i love me eating tv it's one of my one of my favorite things with all of those old uh those old shows but that, i i don't know if that's a, a, a sign of how old you are but it, or if it's just uh just the nostalgia part, part of it that you like but i i'm a big fan of that too miss kitty and chester and matt Dillon. those are three of my favorites as well right i mean even for me i mean as you know I, i'm only 30 you know so <laughs> I mean, but Gunsmoke to me is a great show. I watched it with Dad. You know, basically raised me on it, and I think uh, I think a lot of people could get a lot of enjoyment and value out of the show still if they just turned it on. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you an interesting little tidbit that I just learned the other day. I'm a I was a big um, monster movie fan. All those old Universal monster yeah. movies, you know, Frankenstein, the Mummy, the Wolfman, Dracula, all of those and everything. And then as uh, as of course Boris Karloff was the original you know i mean he was like the original guy he was the original he was the frankenstein the original frankenstein yep. plus he was the original mummy but then yep. after um after after boris karloff they had several different people play the part of, of frankenstein one of course was lon cheney jr who also played wolfman in, in that but then there was an actor named glenn strange and glenn strange did several movies as frankenstein and and I think he was even a Frankenstein me, in in Frankenstein meets Abbott and Costello, but do you know who Glenn Strange went on to um, to to be in uh, in a Western TV show? I no, I did not know that. Well, he was Sam the bartender on Gunsmoke. Really? Really? Yes. Well, I that bet that. Uh, see, I'll I'll go I'll go throw that one at Dad later, and he'll be like, "Well, of course I knew that. You didn't know that." <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he will, but yeah, that's a little bit of trivia there. Glenn Strange, who was Frankenstein, wound up in the last parts of his career playing Sam the Bartender on the TV show Gunsmoke. 
that what that sure. means, I don't know. But anyway, I guess it means we're about through with this uh, this segment of the show. But <laughs> once again, hey, thanks for coming on. Tell your dad we said hi. We're going to come down there and see you at Nesbitt, okay, Jerry? Yeah, co- come on down. You know, we'll get down there. I'll show you some things. And, uh, I look forward to it. And I definitely want to get back on, uh, back on the podcast, especially as Great Balls of Fire gets closer to being here. I think there will be more and more to talk about. All right, we'll definitely we'll definitely have you back on then, man. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, finish up those last waffle fries there for me. Don't let don't let Glenn eat your last uh, waffle fry, okay? <laughs> Whoa, hey, you know, I, I was wondering when he was getting a little close to the plate. I was like, man, I'm not. I mean, I'll share my food, but these waffle fries, like, whoa, back up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you talked about uh, Glenn Strange. My ears perked because uh, whenever someone I you know heard Glenn Strange in the same sentence, they were talking about me. <laughs> Yeah, but they're saying, Glenn, you are strange. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, listen, I'm about full. I got to go. I got places to go and people to see. Yeah, me too. I got I to gotta get this show back up and uh, up on the podcast. And like I said, each and every week, every Wednesday, we're brand new with a new episode. We're on all the podcast apps, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Lipson. We're on every single po- podcast platform. To listen or get the links, go to podavenue.com slash king. Of course, you're listening already, but if you're a new listener, podavenue.com slash king. And uh, like I said, follow Jerry on Twitter at Jerry Lawler. Follow me on Twitter at Glenmore CLE. Anything you want to say before you uh, pay the check, King? Just uh, when I leave here, Glenn, don't follow me. The preceding show is a Pod Avenue production.